What do the Seventh-day Adventist Church believe? And are they or are they not a cult? I'm going to be talking today. I'm Jason Oaks. I'm going to be talking today from my book, Sharing Jesus with the Colts, which is available on Amazon as paperback or Kindle. And uh, we're going to be covering chapter 14 in my book on the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so, obviously, if I included them in my book, I do believe that they fit the criterion for a cult. And as you've, if you've seen my previous videos, um, you know that I'm not talking on the basis of their beliefs. I'm talking more on the basis of something called mind control. And mind control, if you can just make it easy and break it down, it's behavior control, information control, thought control, and uh, experience, emotional control. And uh, in my book, in the chapter, I go into several different quotes from former members of the church and those who have done uh, exposés on them on, on how those practices flesh out. But uh, today, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what they believe and a little bit of their history. And so you can kind of see some of the quirky uh, different beliefs that are a re another reason why I would caution people to stay away from this group and why I would put them outside the banner of historic and orthodox Christianity. And so we are people of the free gift where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion in groups such as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So if you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. We release material on the cults at least once a week, and we also have a lot of great material just working through the Bible systematically and studying the Bible here in the community on YouTube. And so let's go ahead and jump in. So are they a cult or not? Walter Martin in his book, Kingdom on the Cults, early on in his ministry, he was uncategorical uh, in his uh, in definitive and that they were a cult. And then later on in his ministry, he took that back. We kind of went a little bit lighter on that. So what do they believe? They believe that one must worship on the Sabbath, meaning they categorize it as the Jewish people would, from Friday to sundown to Saturday at sundown. And so if you're not worshiping on the Sabbath, then you're not following God's procedures. Some who are more radical within the movement, and kind of going back to some of the earlier teachings, would even say that worshiping on Sunday is taking the mark of the beast. And of course, if you read Revelation, that's not a good thing. And so they believe you must worship on the Sabbath. They believe that Jesus is Michael the archangel. And as we're going to see, they have a lot of beliefs in common with the Jehovah's Witnesses, but some that are like slightly different. And the reason is because they have similar origin stories. Uh, there was a guy named William Miller who was teaching that Jesus was going to come back in 1843 at first, and then he realized he was wrong, and then he said 1844. There were, he convinced a lot of people. He had a following called Bible Students, in which um, then they uh, believed that Jesus was going to come back in 1844, so they had people selling their homes, quitting their jobs, and they were literally dressed in white, waiting for Jesus to return on the day that William Miller had said. It was called the Great Disappointment. Afterwards, William Miller realized that he had made a fatal error and he repented of his teachings. And he kind of withdrew as a pastor and kind of just went off into the distance in the sunrise. But he had two followers, Charles Days Russell and Ellen G. White. And both of those followers came up with different versions of what happened and why Jesus didn't come back, and they became the orig originators of two different movements, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, respectively. And so it should not be surprising that there are similar beliefs. Now, when it comes to Jesus, they believe that he's Michael the Archangel, but not in the same sense as the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses would say Jesus is not God, and he is Michael the archangel. So he is a created being. He's the first creation of God through whom God created everything else. 
The Seventh-day Adventists would say that in the Old Testament, Michael is the title that you see given to Jesus. And they didn't previously believe in the Trinity, but in recent years, they have begun believing in the Trinity um, in that uh, orthodox sense. So that is uh, their view on Jesus. And there's also a quirkiness in that they believe in three phases to the atonement. So the death on the cross of Jesus was phase one of the atonement. Phase two is where you get the explanation that was come back, come up with by the Seventh-day Adventist Church as to why Jesus didn't come back in 1844. It was claimed uh, Hiram Edson, who was also a follower of uh, William Miller, he, on the morning after of the Great Disappointment, on October 23, 1844, he was walking through a cornfield, he was praying and asking God why this happened, and then he claimed he had a vision, he received new light, and in his vision he was informed Jesus was not to show up in 1844, but rather he moved from one part of heaven to cleanse the sanctuary. He moved to the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary, and he began the investigative judgment. The investigative judgment is where Jesus is literally going through the files in heaven and he on every single person and he uh, is deciding who is worthy to take his name and who is not, which brings up a whole nother problem and that is the whole salvation by works. What you are going to find is that the, the Seventh-day Adventists, like many of these groups, are very Old Testament oriented. That's what's going on with the Sabbath. That's what's going on with the health codes. That's what's going on with the whole idea of the most holy place, the scapegoat, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, and even this whole salvation by works feel is all very Old Testament oriented, okay? So... Uh, Hiram Edson was a key person, and he introduced this idea of the investigative judgment, and Jesus has apparently been going through the files in heaven since 1844. Now, this goes along with another doctrine that Ellen G. White taught that is no longer being taught in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and that is the shut-door doctrine. Uh, Ellen G. White believed that nobody else could be saved after the 1844 date. When Jesus moved into the most holy place, the investigative judgment had begun, and so the files are sealed and shut so that Jesus has time to go through them, and when he is done, then comes the judgment. Now, the third part of the atonement, as I mentioned earlier, is called the scapegoat. Now, you remember in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement that there would be two animals that would be sacrificed. One that would be actually sacrificed and the other was called the scapegoat. And they would symbolically lay the sins of the people, the high priest would, on the scapegoat and then they would send him out of town. And so you would have the symbolism of the sins of the people being ushered out of town. They're going away. And they, and Elgin White taught that the scapegoat was Satan. And what that means is they believe that ultimately, at the end, that all of the sins of the world are going to be placed on Satan as the scapegoat. Now, if you don't see a problem with that, then I don't know what to tell you. Because the sins of the world were laid upon Jesus, Jesus bore them, he paid for them, it's finished on the cross, and he satisfied the wrath of God because death could not hold him, yet he paid for the sins of the world there on the cross. So, uh, the other key figure here was Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates also taught the investigative judgment. He came upon higher medicine's teachings and he was a strong proponent that a New Testament believer should be following the Sabbath. And so he became known as the Apostle of the Sabbath. And he also brought in the health-conscious attitude of the Seventh-day Adventists. But Ellen G. White is the most prominent figure and founder of this movement. 
she identified herself as a prophet. Now, what you need to know, uh, and she claimed she was a prophet, but she had several false prophecies. But what you need to know, this is kind of a key thing, and this is kind of interesting because Joseph Smith of the Mormons also had a very traumatic event in his childhood. And psychologists would tell you that when you have a super traumatic event, especially if it was a trauma, especially if it was like a blow to the head, that that can cause a lot of very interesting experiences later on in life. Now, I'm not saying that it's the exclusive reason why certain things happen, why Ellen G. White has certain experiences or has claimed to know certain things or believe that she was a prophet, but I do believe that it played a factor, just like I believe that the traumas in Joseph Smith's life played a factor in his life. So, let's talk about this. Ellen G. White, when she was in school, when she was young, somebody threw a rock at her and hit her in the face she went into a coma, and later on in life, she was diagnosed with brain injuries. Okay? But Ellen G. White claimed to have many different visions. She utters some prophecies in these visions. And many witnesses testify to the fact that during these experiences, Ellen G. White did not breathe. Her pulse went by at a, at a normal rate. Her countenance remained pleasant, but she did not breathe, and she seemed unconscious of everything transpiring around her and viewed herself as removed from this world and in the presence of heavenly beings. That is scary. So let's talk about some of these false prophecies. Ellen White predicted that Jesus was going to come back in 1844, 1845, and then 1849. She believed, uh, she taught specifically June of 1845. And of course, all of those things were wrong. Joseph Bates announced at the time a trouble had begun. In 1850, Ellen G. White said the mighty shaking that you read about in the book of Hebrews had commenced, referring to the end, the time of the tribulation. And to round that out, what she was saying, her husband was also claiming that when Jesus said, come out of her, my people, referring to Babylon, that this departure had already completed. Meaning that those who were going to be saved were saved, and they had come out of the false nominal church, which they believed was Babylon. Lastly, Ellen G. White predicted the end would be sometime that all those present and alive during 1856 would not all pass away before Christ returned. And so that's kind of her form with the investigated judgment and the shut door doctrine and all these things are kind of their form of not anticipating that it was going to take this long for Jesus to come back. In 2018, we're still waiting. And of course, this over 150 years removed from 1856. So they teach something called soul sleep. Now, soul sleep didn't originate with the JWs or with Seventh-day Adventists. It actually originated with a Methodist preacher named George Storrs. And he taught that no conscious part of a human being survives death. When one dies, the part of them that returns to God is breath. Okay, so the word uh, pneuma in the Greek is soul. It also means breath. And so they literally meant, believe that the breath of a person is what their soul, and so that is the only part that goes back to God, that everything physical is just God. When the resurrection happens, these bodies are resurrected. God breathes the breath of life into them and fills this being, the body that looks like that individual's body with all the thoughts, memories and of the original person that once was. But God has to recreate that person on the resurrection. They had ceased to exist, okay? Then comes the judgment, whether for eternal life or annihilation. They do have their own translation of the Bible. Uh, it's not like an official thing, but it's encouraged and used quite often within the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It's called the Clear Word Bible. Now, what you need to understand is much like the message or the living Bible, in that it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase. It's more of a commentary. And you can tell the difference because the person's beliefs are stuck in and infused into the text 
in spite of it being an inaccurate translation and rendering of the original language. And that's exactly what the Clear Word Bible is, much like the New Word tra Translation, New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses or Joseph Smith's inspired version of the Bible. They believe in annihilation, so after Jesus comes back, there's going to be a great resurrection where everybody comes back to life, the good and the bad. And like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists teach one cataclysmic moment for each person where they are burned up. So if you get into heaven, great. But if you're not going to get into heaven, you get just annihilated. A moment of, it might be painful, but it's quick, it's over with, and it's done. There is no eternal conscious torment. There is no hell, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I talked to you about the shut door doctrine. I talked to you about the investigative judgments. And I talked to you about the scapegoat. And like I said, uh, my book also details a lot of mind control practices, which is the thing that in spite of everything that I just said, this is the stuff that over the top, it, it classifies them as a cult. The evidence of mind control and uh, abusive practices are what sets a group uh, as a cult as apart from false Christianity or just a completely different religion altogether. And so I also go over some terminology things Flesh food, health message, great controversy, investigative judgment, pen of inspiration, present truth, and the testimonies of some terms that you, you should know when you're talking to people of this group. And I talk about those in my book. Again, that's Sharing Jesus with the Colts, available on Amazon as paperback or Kindle. And uh, feel free to give me any comments or questions that you have in regards to this video. I will reply to every comment. Um, within reason, and uh, if it gets to be too much, I might just do a weekly Q&A in which I take some of the questions and I address them. And so go ahead and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Give us a thumbs up on this video if you like the content for the day, and share this with other people in your life who might know people within the Seven Day Adventist movement, might have a heart to reach those who are caught in religion, and help us to get the word out and help people come into a relationship with the biblical Jesus and know that they have eternal life. And until next time, may God's grace be with you.